The Spin-Off Podcast Network. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The Spin-Off's new documentary, k p o l i s follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side-eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like, celebrate yourself. Watch k p o l i s today at thespinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callaghan Innovation, New Zealand's innovation agency. Here's your host, Simon Pound. Laneway is now a staple on the local festival scene. And while lots of you are probably frantically trying to organise yourselves for the day, spare a thought for today's guest who started working on this one before the last one was even done. And just days out from perhaps the biggest day of his year is here to talk to us. Laneway co-promoter Mark Kneebone started out at indie record label COG, honed his skills at his own shop, Isaac Promotions, and graduated to running first Laneway and then promoting some of the biggest names in the business as head of promotions at Live Nation. the massive international entertainment company that has a stake in Spark Arena, recently partnered with Rhythm and Vines, and brings some of the biggest names in music to New Zealand. In that role, Mark has promoted gigs across the whole spectrum, from the big like Adele, Pharos and Six Nights of Pink, to the more niche but still pretty big like Aldous Harding. To talk the music business, brown M&M riders, and pioneering programmes to cut down harassment at his festival, Mark joins us now. G'day. Hey, how you going? Oh, good, thank you, mate. Nice to see you. Hey, so first up, that kind of t- title, co-promoter. Mm. What does a co-promoter of a festival like uh, Laneway do? Uh, something like Laneway, you kind of you kind of do it all. You're, there, you're the first person there and you're the last person to leave. But really, um, you know, it's kind of like being a producer on a TV show or a movie. You know, you, my partner and I uh, work together to kind of do everything from booking bands to – You know, dealing with the council on sites, you know, making sure we have enough money, paying the bills. Um, there's so much compliance that goes into it. But the main thing is, is you're in charge. So after 10 years, I really consider my biggest job is to protect what laneway is and what it means. And that's really, really hard. And it gets harder and harder every year to uh, to try and stay true to the reasons that you're doing it in the first place. And um, as commercial pressures get bigger and more people want to be involved or some people don't want to be involved, um, you know, your, your job really is, and I can't think of a better word, but it sounds so cheesy, is to be a bit of a guardian around the ethos of the festival and, and, and why it exists. And, you know, that's, that's kind of your primary role. Everything else spins off that. Yeah, it's quite a rare role, isn't it? It's like being uh, the CEO, but also as the name promoter implies like you know you're you're in charge you're gonna make sure the marketing works and you're yeah, gonna yeah, make totally. sure that the uh, the bill is exciting yeah, to people yeah, totally and I, i guess that producer in, in hollywood is a good thing because you're also kind of you're on the line aren't you yeah totally on the line you know um and uh yeah it's like it's very weird you know obviously I've, i've worked in business for a long time now but you have you know trying to plan long term you're like well i assume that will work so then we'll be able to do that and then do that but I've had festivals, I've had a laneway, I've had two laneways that have lost money. Um, I've had other festivals or shows that have lost money, considerable amounts, and, and obviously vice versa. But, um, you know, that's, I think it's a key driver for a festival that, you know, you have some skin in the game. Um, you know, that's not a criticism of people who work on festivals who don't. It's just, but if you want to promote it, you know, 
you know, you learn a lot of lessons staring at the ceiling at 3 a.m., wondering what you're going to do and how you're going to pay for your mortgage for the next year because this festival is not working or something, you know, and it just adds that extra weight to it. But also, for me anyway, it gives a lot more, it gives that extra layer of um, incentive and, and kind of drive. Yeah, because yeah, I imagine from the outside a lot of people must – kind of think you have quite a glamorous kind of job and <laughs> on one look at it it could be well you know i guess i'd better go to these international festivals and see the upcoming acts to book something yeah. uh but also if one of those acts pulls out or yeah. you know there's so many things outside of your control yeah that's in, yeah. in being uh, a, a promoter as yeah. well i'm luckily like i'm not a control freak type personality of for whatever reason just kind of being able to roll with the punches of a lot of it like this year we had billy eilish um, pull out of the tour, which was, you know, she was a huge part of, you know, the identity of this year's show and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, there's there's literally nothing you can do about it. You know what I mean? We we talked at length to try and change her mind and accommodate. She needs to do, do some recording and some and finish a record that was drastically overdue and all these kinds of things. Um, but you can't control that. So that is what it is. And um, I don't think you can be a promoter type if you have to be across every detail. This is just, it's just too big. You have to delegate it and you have to find the right team and you have to trust them and um or else you're just either you're only ever going to do really small festivals or you're just gonna go insane and take everyone with you, you know? Yeah, let, let's go um let's come back to the big side of things yeah. in a minute. But really interested in just kind of going back and kind of like, you know, charting how you got into a role that touches so many bits of like business and culture mm. and people's kind of um interests yeah. as well. How did you get the music bug? Where did you start? Oh, I, was, I was raised in a family that constantly had music on. Um, my dad and my older brother were my biggest uh, early musical influences. And then um, it was a classic thing. I started playing drums in high school and then started playing in bands. And then um, some friends and I had like just kind of were renting this really dilapidated kind of former mansion in St. John's when I was, I was like 21 or 22. So we built a studio uh, you know, that's a very liberal use of the word studio. It was basically an eight track with some microphones. A uh, couple of egg cartons. Yeah, t- totally. To the wall. Literally, yeah, like yeah, it was right. ultimate DIY. But we started recording and then someone bought some drum machines and suddenly you're making electronic music and, and staying up till, you know, 6 a.m. every night to do that while trying to finish a university degree. And um, and then, you know, we met the guys from COG. They were doing mastering. And then they were like, you guys should put start a record label. And I was like, okay, I have no idea what that is. And fell into, that's how I fell into the music industry. And then I ended up started working at COG. And then COG, which was this amazing small kind of boutique indie festival, um, not because I arrived there, I'm not saying that, but as I arrived there, it exploded. Mm. Mainly because um, an artist, P Money, released a record called Big Things. And uh, COG had had some success in the past. I think they had one record go gold, a, a pitch black record. But that really that p money record changed the way that label and also it was a huge boom in new zealand music at the time and of course the star off the back of that was scribe and then scribe put out the crusader and and that label just went you know supernova in terms of an indie and then suddenly concord dawn's got a platinum record and shapeshift has got a gold record and like you know they everything we were putting out at the time and you know there's some really smart people working there doing really great things and um and that's how I got into the music industry. And then I was hooked. I had a, I had a degree that I've never used since, and um, and was offered a job, you know, um, to go to TV three and do some stuff there, doing sound stuff, or stay at Cog. And I was like, oh, I'm definitely staying here for minimum less than minimum wage. But <laughs> you know, it was like doing your PhD in the music industry, and you know, you work with big companies like Universal, and and then uh, left Cog. Um, set up a shop called Isaac Promotions, doing a lot of work for kind of like as a gun for hire, marketing publicity for a lot of international labels, local bands, and then fell into promoting. Um, because I, I joined the record industry in 2001, which was the peak of CD income. And by the time, and over the next 10 years, it was at 40% of the value of what it was when I started. Like, that's how bad the route was. Like, literally, major labels were literally shut- shuttering whole floors of buildings. That's not an exaggeration, you know, and and just layoffs. And, like, the I came in just as the party peaked. And then yeah, yeah. by the time I got to the end of 20s, it was just, it was so bad, yeah. And, and you came in through, um, you, you know, one of the growth areas in music, mm. which was, you, you know, independent mm. and uh, really close kind of like artist community mm. kind of stuff, mm. hey? Mm. And then turn that into some quite interesting roles 
being an advocate for independent mm. music yeah. at the table yeah. with these big um, players. Yeah. T- tell us a little bit about kind of, you know, uh, you, you, I, I remember um, year, years ago, you know, you, you, you being at uh, things as like a guy in your mid 20s yeah. with the heavyweights and yeah, the yeah, kind of the involved, tops of yeah. the music industry. I got involved in a thing called Merlin, mm. which was, which now is like a huge player in the, in the digital music digital rights management um you know seen worldwide but basically what it was is as youtube and and um not even spotify this is before that and like this we're talking about the microphone microsoft zoom player and all these different things you had these big companies that were monetizing making money off music but they weren't paying anyone for the use of the music like youtube were you know you'd go click on a, a thing for say p money and watch it and they'd sell ads around it but they never paid p money so the major labels all did a deal with youtube and then the, and then you know, Google, Apple, all these companies basically ignored the independents because they were a third of the market, but there was thousands of them. So a visionary guy called Martin Mills, who runs Beggars UK, still does, decided to get, you know, like 12 independents together to create an organization where all of the independents put all their rights into one pool and this organization Merlin would negotiate on their behalf. And through a weird fluke of geography, they wanted someone from Australasia to sit on this board. And the CEO of the company is a guy called Charles Coldis, who's still there. He's an Australian. So they went, oh, no, it's got to be a Kiwi. And then they were like, who do we know down there? And someone was like, oh, just get that Nebone guy. We need someone young. Like literally that was the criteria. And for the next three years, I was on this board. And I used to get flown around the world to have these meetings. And like suddenly you're literally at the U.S. consulate getting deposed on antitrust questions for a waiver to pull all these resources so you could go in then and sue someone you know what i mean like these really bizarre situations and um but it was awesome and it was like this and you know you're literally with you know the heads of the some of the biggest labels in the world and you're sitting around plotting and scheming to 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 represent your artist better and it was this crash course on you know, I got a really good piece of advice after the first meeting where I didn't say anything because I was just terrified. And a guy called Tommy Silverman who ran Tommy Boy Records, a big like De La Soul and all these amazing hip-hop records came up to me and goes, if you're not going to say anything, leave and we'll get someone else. And I was like, oh. And he's like, that's why you're here. You're not here. We didn't fly you here to just sit there. Like he's really <laughs> blunt and he's really angry at me. And he was like, you know, because he was one of the guys like, yeah, I've met Mark before, get him. So the next meeting I was like, just – Trying to like, I think I even wrote notes. I'm like, I'm going to say something, and here's a good point. And I'd like fire off a few, and then you get the hang of it. And then, like, you know, after three years, you're like arguing with the guy who, for Horst Weidenmuller, who's the head of K7, and you're like, no, nah, no, nah, you're wrong. It's this, this, this. And they're like, oh, okay. And you just, one of those things, you just get used to it, you know. It's, so that was a real crash course in how to deal with people who, whose career were way further along than yours, like, and how to be respectful, how to get a point across in a meeting, you know, all those kinds of things that have served me really, really well since. Yeah. And especially, I imagine, in an industry like music where you do get uh, in the kind of leadership roles, people who are kind of big personalities oh, yes. and, yeah, yeah. and unusual kind of personalities maybe yeah, uh, for the rest of business, hmm. risk takers, entrepreneurs, hmm. but also, uh, and this is what you were exactly doing there um, at the table, there are so many rights and mm. different owners yeah, and totally. license holders. It's a, it's a complete minefield. The yeah. world of music is yeah. just the most arcane, Byzantine, yeah. totally. weird system. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of built for, for a whole bunch of different people who, you know, on the surface may seem to have little to do with music to make a whole lot of money out of it. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. is like I always think that the hardest job after the artist is the manager because they've got to deal with publishers, you know, uh, labels, promoters, you know, festivals, merch people, you know, like publicity. You know, it's such a hard job because you're dealing with 360 degrees of the artists. And then the hardest job of all, which is dealing with the act, with the artist. And I've seen so many great managers just get burnt, you know, and I've seen so many great artists get burnt as well, mm-hmm. you know, just because it didn't click or whatever, and you know what I mean? And and, and sadly, the, a lot of this industry and a lot of promoting especially is driven by a very short-term view and that, and a lot of that is quite a reasonable, to, in my mind, um, uh, path to take because you have such a short window. And you know, artists aren't stupid; they know that. And it's like being a professional athlete. You know, it's like 
if you get, I think the average length of a career in the NFL I read is like three and a half years, which is just nuts. Because you spent your entire life preparing for it. You know, it's the same for for pop acts or bands or whatever. You get the most of them get a brief window, and so you know you get a real like dog eat dog mentality. Will come out and they'll fire a manager, get a bigger manager, or whatever. They'll trade this for that, and it, it's, it can be very disheartening to watch. Or you know they'll just take the biggest money offer as opposed to the best offer for what's the long term view for touring that territory, but. That's yeah. how it goes, you know. And and sports is a really interesting analogy too because luck can play such mm. a role in yeah. music. And, uh, you know, you talk to bands who were about to be uh, the supporting act on a really big names American tour and then for some reason got dropped and mm. then they went from being just about to become a household yeah. name yeah. to not, not doing the thing. And yeah. like just like an athlete might have an injury. Totally. And I, I can think of, I won't name them, but I can think of two really prominent, three really prominent examples of New Zealand bands who were right about to blow up and something went wrong and that was it, their chance was over. And you just look back on it and go, that's absolutely brutal, but that's the, you know, that's how it is. For every band that's about to have that opportunity, there's seven behind them that are ready to step in when they stalled. And that's what happened to those three acts, you know. Yeah, let's talk about that idea of like um, talent in terms of a festival because mm. um, it'd be interesting to come back to kind of like how, how you got into Laneway and got it mm. off the ground. But such a part of that job must be knowing what the next um, the next big thing is because how how far ahead are you booking the headline We're and the second next year? And I imagine you can't afford just to buy but someone you know is going to be big, so you have to take a bit of a uh, oh, I think they're going to be a bigger name in a year's no, time. Totally, like um, you know. We had a conversation just almost a year ago about that called a boogie with a hoodie. And, you know, we took a really long look at it and, and the music was, was, was awesome, but there's no shortage of awesome music. Like, I think that's the first thing you got to realize when you look at, um, at a festival. Like, there's so many amazing acts, but also when you look at who you want, automatically 90% of what you want, that list you've drawn is unavailable. Yeah. Like, that's not an exaggeration. So you're automatically down to just the last 10%. And then it's a dogfight between you and every other festival on who's going to get it. So, you know, we look at something like Boogie with a Hoodie and we're like, the music is amazing, but, you know, is it is it going to fall into place, all the rest of it? And and we paid at the time what I thought was quite a lot for the act because, you know, we weren't the only festival trying to get it. And then it's very satisfying that a year later, his num- here's the number one record in America this week and Laneway's on Monday. And you're like, wow, we nailed that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, okay, cool. But it's the same with you know, Florence and the Machine. The first time um, on the first laneway she played, um, she had to get tour support from the label to come down and play because the laneway fee was so small because we just, we just, one, we just didn't have the money, and two, we were like, you, we've literally never heard of you. You know, your record's not out in Universal like this. She's going to be a hit. It's going to be awesome. It was the same with the XX. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And, you know, and, and you're like. And then they had that uh, song together that yeah. that year oh, that no. became yeah. the biggest song of the summer. And, 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 and you know, yeah. but that's the way it goes. But, like, don't get me wrong, there's plenty that I thought. I always thought Warpaint were going to be the biggest band in the world. And they just totally turned out not to be, you know, which is a bummer because they're a great band. Um, but you're, you're looking for. You know, and it's not just me or just us either. You have, you have to have a wider pool. I'm also really conscious of the fact I turned 40 this year. Mm. So I'm trying to take less and less of a um, hand on the cutting edge and trying to mentor two people um, that work with me to, to, to step into that. So, like, you know, I'm not at Whammy Bar at 2 a.m. on a Thursday. You know mm. what I mean? Like, those days are over, thank God. You know what I mean? Um, but someone from Laneway needs to be. So it's either, um, you know, like, I don't know if you know Sam Harmon or if it's Georgia Parker or whatever, you know what I mean? The people that we work with, you know, they're out there looking at bands and constantly, and they'll come back and go, I think it's this, this, this. And my role is with that local stuff is much more to be like, okay, why? How's it going to fit into the festival? Trying to teach, trying to pass on the knowledge of how something – that's amazing, the, you know, the process then on how that fits into the show. Mm. You have to think all the way through to what time are they going to be playing, who, what kind of act they're going to be playing before, all that kind of stuff. You're thinking of, like, much further down the track than this band is just awesome, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and do they do they bring a following? <laughs> yeah, totally, of course. <laughs> yeah, which is, which yeah. is I think, when you've only got so many local yeah. acts to put on. So. Yeah, but one, one thing that Laneway, we're really, we have less pressure than everyone else is we're not – this year is different, but um, we're not a headline-driven festival. You know, a lot of people um, go to Laneway because they want to go to Laneway, and yeah. that's a huge advantage that we have. Um, also, we're a smaller festival, you know, 13,000 people, so we don't have that commercial pressure where it's like, okay, we need someone who's going to shift 20,000 tickets on day one. It's like, 
you know, we don't, so we don't have to book Radiohead. And my festival doesn't hinge on whether or not Radiohead are going to say yes or no because Radiohead aren't idiots. They're going to turn around to any festival and be like, cool, I want quadruple. You know what I mean? And they'll get it, you know, mm-hmm. where we don't have that pressure because we managed to build a show that people trust us. You know what I mean? They were like, ah, oh. the most common comment we get when we announce the lineup is people go, I don't know who these bands are. But we still sell 13,000 tickets because people trust us that Boogie with a Hoodie is going to be awesome or that, you know, John Hopkins is going to be amazing and, you know, or Mitski's an act that they should check out. You yeah. know? And it actually becomes kind of a, a listening aid for yeah. some of us people who are <laughs> aging out of being relevant to things. And you're like, oh, I'd better listen to the, the Laneway playlist and work out what's good <laughs> ahead of the gig. Do, do my homework. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, um, and, and in terms of getting into the, um, the actual promotion side of mm. it, because taking that on, I mean, you call it there a small festival, mm. 13,000 people. Mm. It doesn't look like that small uh, an undertaking, um, especially, uh, you know, with all of the moving parts of a place that it hasn't had just one home. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's, there's been a whole lot of steps. What kind of things did you have to kind of like um, upskill in or, or build to be able to go from being a promoter of acts and working mm. on their promotions and involved in the music mm. industry to being a promoter of a festival festival i'm um, yeah, going back to like the skills i learned with that merlin thing you suddenly you have to deal with people in authority like suddenly you're sitting down and dealing talking with the mayor and you're having an honest conversation about if we can't move into albert park we're going to take the show to wellington and that wasn't an empty threat we had an offer from wellington council they were going to give us the money we were going to go um, because we were, we couldn't stay in Silo Park. We had already stayed there one or two years long. People were starting to complain because it was too hot and it was too hot. Um, we couldn't, we had every short term fix to provide more shade in there we had done. And it just wasn't suit, suitable for purpose anymore. Plus the, uh, Sanfords and, and, um, the, the massive landlord down there wanted us out as well because we were screwing up their business and we were, you know, because we were taking over that Auckland anniversary weekend period. So, you know, um, you have to deal with with councils, people, you learn what people's motivations are, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, and that's served me well on other things like Pharos and stuff like that, is you're dealing with a whole lot of people who don't need uh, your festival or your event, you know what I mean? So you have to present it and make it attractive to them and they're going to get something out of it, you know what I mean? So, like, we're going to put this show in a regional park, for Farrah's example, um, and, you know, there's no real reason that we should be allowed to go in there, but, you know, the fact is we sold 12,000 tickets and 28% of those people came from overseas, so we, that's yeah. how we sold it in, and they're like, of course you can put it in there, you know, you're going to sell 4,000 hotel room nights and all that kind of stuff, so you get, you start thinking about it on a much more macro level. Um, that's that's yeah. totally right. Can I just quickly mm-hmm. jump in there and go, how the hell did you get Varos to New Zealand? Like, it had oh, been, yeah. the, he, <laughs> like D- Donald Glover, actually the biggest artist in the world mm. at that exact moment. Mm. You know, um, the, the talk le- about timing for a single, by the way. The, <laughs> yeah. the, lead, the lead in television, yeah, yeah, totally. music, mm. and movies, mm. pop culture like mm. icon. He's done this festival once yep. in Joshua Tree, yep. and it's like a thing of legend yep. amongst music people. Mm. And then he tweets for the first time mm. in however long to say mm. it's going to be in New Zealand mm. and the whole world loses its mind. Yeah, that's right. I got a random phone call from a guy called Ryan McGarrett at Live Nation and he was like, hey man, um, he's up in LA and he's like, we're going to do Pharos again. Um, Donald wants to do it in New Zealand. His managers are flying down like on Tuesday. And I was like, okay, it's like you know the week before. I'm in it. I was actually in San Francisco. I was like, okay, I better fly home flew home beat them back by like a day whatever it was and we just drove around all these places in the north island and like we we're all in this car driving around it was just like this is and like at first i was like here's all the reasons this is a dumb idea no 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 and i was on the phone with ryan and ryan was like yeah basically a really gently way of like i outrank you by like 70 places we're doing this i was like, okay cool and um but basically they explained they were looking you know, this is Donald's a really creative person and needed something that's an amazing outlet for him. And um, and New Zealand was the highest, one of the highest selling territories that he'd never toured in. And he loved the idea of doing it in New Zealand. That's why I came here. And we found the site and it took us like three months to get Auckland City, Auckland Regional Parks Council, all the rest of it to agree to let us go in there. And um, yeah, and then we, then we announced the show, which was, you know, hilarious. And, and part of that thing of like, 
getting those big acts to New Zealand. Like, there's a couple of factors, aren't there? Like, being able to take someone like Donald Glover, who can do anything he wants, mm. to somewhere as special as um, the site for yeah. the the um, the Pharos yeah. is really cool. But also the kind of coming on board of big infrastructure, which mm. isn't nearly as exciting, but yeah, it's a big yeah, thing. Of. Like, life before the previously Vector, mm. now Spark Arena, yeah. and life after are completely different in it, terms it of the, the industry. That, yeah. that are coming here. Hey, and completely changed the industry in New Zealand in, when uh, Vector, now Spark, opened. Um, before you had the Super Top, which God bless it did its job. Oh, but boy, was that super Top. Yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, which I love that its capacity fluctuated between eight and 12,000, depending on, uh, you know, which way the wind was blowing. But, um, it was great for rock and roll shows, but pretty much awful for everything. Oh, and, and the odd, like, you know, big dance party, but like, it was awful for everything else. Um, but having the arena, it gave you know certainty for promoters on things like weather, and there's a lot of acts who just weren't coming to Auckland because they refused to play in a tent. Mm. And it's fair enough. Like uh, these are acts who are building arena shows, and the problem with that tent is you couldn't hang anything in the roof. So you know, eighty percent of your lights didn't work. You couldn't put up LED walls, all that kind of stuff. And, but in an arena, and you, you can want, hang everything. You know, do you want twelve thousand fans to turn up and have an average sound experience? Yeah, totally, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, you just don't. You, you just know, don't. it's, yeah, it's yeah. a huge thing for your yeah. followers. Yeah. Where the arena, um, you know, it, it gave an outlet. Then suddenly, we, were just, you know, you just see the avalanche of shows that came off the back of that. But not only that, opening that, you know, uh, after cruise ships, Spark Arena is the second biggest reason. Uh, Auckland sells hotel nights. It shows at Spark Arena, you know, which is a fact that I don't think they publicise enough. But it's like transformed the way that you know the hotel industry, hospitality, you know, um, shows most shows in in uh, Auckland um, at Spark Arena. Like a third to fifty percent of the people come from outside of Auckland to come to the show. So it's a massive tourism draw, mm. you know. what I mean, for rental cars, everything, you know. So. But then it also allowed more promoters to invest in the territory, but also sound companies, lights, AV, mm. all of that. So suddenly you had all this infrastructure in place and then you can start doing things like Ferris because it's there, yeah. you know what I mean? And it also had a massive knock-on effect for the other countries like Horncastle Arena opened in, in Christchurch, so it started getting a bunch more shows. I think you only have to look at how many shows don't go to Wellington now because there's just nowhere suitable to play. TSB Arena is like a joke, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you can't even hang anything in the roof anymore. So, you know, and, you know, we would, if it had an arena, would send 10, 12 tours a year there, but they don't, so we don't, you know. And, and in terms of that, you, the company that you're with now, mm. like Live Nation, they are a part owner in uh, the Spark Arena, aren't they? But mm. also one of the great untold stories of the Spark Arena, I think, is the very friendly ground uh, rental rates from Nati Fatua, <laughs> who, you know, they've really helped to, uh, yeah. to to spark that as a tourism yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and totally, a, jewel, a jewel for the waterfront. Yeah, it's all and, their land. Yeah. No, and, and they've done, done extraordinarily mm. friendly uh, rental arrangements to enable that to happen. Yeah. It's just a totally untold story. Yeah, yeah totally. It's, it's I don't know all the details of it, but like Nati Fatua or Rakai are a, a massive part mm. of that whole development of that part of the city, but also like we're, we're keystone partners for the arena and the project and the concept, you mm. know. And now there's all the talk of a stadium going down there again. Of course, the EU will be front and center as they should be, you know. Mm -hmm. And that company, Live Nation, that you're with, mm -hmm. uh, coming from such an independent <laughs> background, you know, like I yeah. first met you uh, through student radio, yeah, through yeah. B BFM, yeah. and, uh, you know, just, just through a love of music and promoting some very small acts, like not, not, not untalented, wonderfully talented mm -hmm. people, but you were a promoter of, of acts you loved, not mm -hmm. acts who were big yeah. necessarily. And then through Cog, that was mm -hmm. a truly independent spirit. And then, um, I don't know, last year you put on Six Nights of Pink. Yeah. I mean, that, and, and Adele, that's yeah. a huge, you know, um, yeah. the, the biggest names in, in world music. What attracted you about working with um, the absolute kind of like top of the industry? I like wanted that? to learn... I went to LN because I wanted to learn how to do arena touring. I had done arena shows. I'd probably done half a dozen of them. and and But it's the kind of thing, it's a very different kind of tour. And I wanted to learn how to do stadiums. And that meant you were either going to go work for LN, you were going to go work for Frontier, Chug, or Dainty. And like, those were the options. And I had a really good relationship with Live Nation already because some of the people I knew worked there had, had come across. They offered me an amazing role and um, and haven't looked back since. I've been there about three years and I've now done something like 40 or 50 arena tours in that time, you know, four or five stadium tours. feel totally comfortable that I can put an arena tour up 
you know, know what to do, know how to run it, know how to build it, who to work with. You know, we have an amazing team of production and marketing and all the rest of it and, and feel really comfortable in it. Um, but what I love about most about Alien is, is all the big stuff is that they, you can still do all the little stuff without mm. asking any permission or anything. So we did like the two idol shows at Tuning Fork on Sunday and Monday of this week. That, that show on Sunday is probably one of the best shows I've seen in a couple of years. And you're like, why is a band like Idols working with someone like Live Nation? It's like, because we love the band and we had a venue, we put them in it, we sold out both nights and really looked after them. So that's, is, so we're still doing that big level stuff. We're still, you know, we're still able to develop acts because we have responsibility because someone has to. Someone's got to put them in the tuning fork for 350 tickets and build them all the way through the power station to the town hall to an arena, you know what I mean? Because, you know, we can't, if the model is just we just only focus on the big stuff, it's flawed because mm. you need acts to develop into big, in, into into major arena acts, you know. And and so just doing six nights of Pink, which is mm. extraordinary, yeah, isn't it? It's like, crazy. What is that? Seventy thousand people or something? More. Like, yeah, it was like six times twelve. So yeah. Far out. Yeah. You know, that's that that is quite remarkable. And so just doing you, you, you know six nights of that mean that you can fund development yeah, and totally. stuff as well. Hundred yeah, yeah, percent. We're, yeah. we're also lucky that. Um, Stuart Clumpus, who is the chairman of Live Nation New Zealand and also the director of the arena, um, he, a few years ago, pre-Live Nation, set up the tuning fork venue inside the arena. And it's a great little room, holds 350, 375. And that was a huge commitment to developing new talent. And, you know, especially with King's Arms now being a hole in the ground when I drove past the other day, um, you know, there's not a lot of places... You know, you got Whammy Bar doing an amazing job. You got Galatos. You know, but you know, without the tuning fork, it's like, man, where are these? Where are your idols going to play, or where's yeah. that local band? Where's Daffodils going to do their release single party, and all those kinds of things? Like, you can't just have one or two venues. You've got to have yeah. four or five at that small club level. Th- things uh, do seem to be in like quite rude good health, uh, despite a lot of that difficulty. Hey, I was along at the. Um, the Vice Christmas Party, mm. and that was just absolutely fantastic, mm. you know. And, and so many of these um, these acts were such a strong kind of um, yeah, yeah. It just it just it just felt really good yeah. when you do sometimes feel a bit worried about the world when you drive past an empty hole <laughs> yeah. at the King's Arms, yeah, and totally. you feel like one of those old people, you know, like old people used to tell us about great gigs they saw at the Glue Pot. One yeah. day we'll be doing that about yeah, yeah. the King's Arms. The, KA, totally. the kids will be rolling their eyes at us. <laughs> I saw Trans Am at the King's Arms. The King's Arms. <laughs> yeah, totally. But um, look, venues, uh, just to touch on it, are the biggest challenge facing the industry or lack of venues. Like I said before about, probably too harsh about TSB Arena. and uh, <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to have to back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to back that one up. But, um, um, you know, it's, it's like, you know, no arena in Wellington is a huge problem. Um, you know, but really that small club level stuff, you know, that model is getting harder and harder and harder for owners to make work, you know, and, and then, you know, you look at places like Christchurch where there's only like one 300 cap room to play in and, you know, and, and Wellington, you've just got Meow and San Fran, then nothing until you hit the Opera House, you know what I mean? There's big gaps in, 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 in venue sizes, you know, and that's things, one, they can't make the economics work or the rent or, or noise restrictions and stuff like that. And that's a really continuing problem that will continue to, sorry, that is still really makes promoters' jobs really, really difficult. Yeah. You mentioned before about kind of looking after acts, mm. and I guess that's a big part of your uh, job as well, mm-hmm. because acts must talk to each other and they must say, "Oh yeah, you should go to New Zealand." It can't be the first choice on everyone's um, no. agenda to fly all the way to New Zealand to just be able to do two or three gigs yeah. when you know there's so many other places in the world they can get to quicker. It's yeah. less expensive to get their gear yeah. to, totally. and they make more money. Yeah, and, and especially you tour New Zealand like nowhere else in the world because everywhere else you basically drive you get in a tour bus across europe or, or across america and you in most cases you just drive from show to show to show we're here you've got to fly you can't drive to wellington to play the next night it's just not practical you know um, it's a really long way and the biggest problem with the high-end shows with the arena level and up is um the show's getting bigger and bigger, so everyone's bringing more and more stuff with them, and it's getting more and more expensive to bring that stuff in. So when we did Taylor Swift, it was six Russian cargo planes worth of stuff that she brought with her. You know, and the, the cost is astronomical. And is that just on on put on? Sorry, is that just from 
Sydney kind of tacked on yeah, to their date. Tacked on to a date. Yeah. And, and these two, I think they're called Antonov Plane, whatever the ones that open up at the front, made three return trips each to, to the East Coast of Australia, get us stuff to bring it over here. You know, and you're, you're so restrained not putting all that stuff on your Instagram. You know, like that, that must be so cool to see, like a, a awesome. military operation yeah, level awesome. kind of setup. It's awesome. Uh, I've, my whole my whole uh, theory on social media being a promoter is that the act should be the star. That I can think of a few of my peers who, who take the very opposite way, and I mock them relentlessly for it. <laughs> but um, you know, so you know, the the problem is is that as these shows get bigger and bigger. Because in America, they just drive it everywhere. So you need an extra LED screen to put another truck on the road, which is really cost effective. But as soon as you're flying everything, it's really, really hard. So we're missing out on shows now in New Zealand. Yeah, That's like, starting to happen. Like Kanye West stages and stuff that yeah. don't make it from Australia. Yeah, or the Beyonce, Jay-Z on the run stuff where you're just like, it was like 70 trucks or something ridiculous to get that show around. And you're just like, okay, we just... It's actually easier to fly New Zealanders to Sydney. Yeah, totally, 100%. Yeah. You know? And so that's a problem that's not going anywhere and it's going to get worse and worse. And I think we'll lose more big end shows because we just you just can't make the money needed to get the, the to cover the freight bills. Yeah. Working with artists, um, you must get asked these kind of brown M&M mm. kind of questions about ridiculous writers and stuff. And I mean, that one was famously about... Um, Acts wanting to find out that people were actually paying attention, paying yeah. attention, and so they wouldn't get electrocuted. Yeah. But is that you know is is that still um you, you know is that still a big factor because artists I don't know musicians and in, in they're one of the last groups that never have to grow up you know yeah, totally. so they can't get easier to deal with along really the way well. like how how do, yeah and you see these kind of you know, seven year olds still trying to yeah. hold on to their kind of totally. eighteen year old peak yeah. kind of thing how 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 does that kind of play into things and um. You know, are, are difficult writers and are those demands a special thing in the business? So, yeah, you definitely get unique, strange stuff. But now, more so than ever, it's much more health-focused. So, like, I want this kind of chef doing this kind of thing, you know, quinoa, no, 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 no. And you're like, it's, everything's gluten-free and all this It's fine, you know what I mean? Um, because the schedules are so brutal uh, for these artists that they've got to play, you know, and if they miss a show, they lose so much money, even with insurance. Um that, you know, everyone's trying to just stay, keep going and be able to go out there and play a show. That's in most cases, you still very much get the, you know, four geezers from, from Bristol who are just on the lash in New Zealand and, and having a great time, which is, which is awesome. You know what I mean? Good on you, young fella. You know what I mean? You go with it. And you definitely get the, the aging icons who, who want to act like, you know, they're, they're still in their mid twenties, but, um, on the whole, it's not as extravagant as you think, but there are some massive exceptions. Like the best one, I, 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 this wasn't my show I heard about, is uh, a friend of mine had to build a water feature fountain that cost him $17,000 because it had to be bespoke built. And the lo- and it was in the hallway at Spark Arena and it had to have certain like made out of like porcelain, whatever. And like someone came in and built it. And like they sent the designs and all this, and the lighting had to be on. And when he, this artist pulled into the into the loading dock, they turned it on and all the rest of it. And the artist just walked around a different way, went into the room, played, and walked out the, the other way, and never saw the water feature that they had spent seventeen thousand dollars on. And you're just like, oh yeah. But sometimes that's how it goes, you know. What I mean? So you get like there's a lot of stories like that where you're just like, that's a lot. That's you got to pay send someone to university for that. But you know whatever. Yeah. And I'm pretty. Pretty sure you know. I'm pretty sure he took part of that water feature and put it in his garden at the end of the show, oh. and just kind of held on to it because he's like, "Oh well, you know, we spent all this money on it." <laughs> That's you know? fantastic. Yeah. yeah, there must be a lot of those moments. Yeah. A, a couple, a couple of the questions, um, a couple of the that you probably just can't tell us on yeah. um, a recorded thing as well. But um, it, it, a couple of the questions that we ask everyone on this thing, like, um, what what advice do you have for people who are interested in? kind of getting into that kind of entrepreneurial life uh, of music or around creativity or the arts? Oh, God, it's way easier to make a career of it now than it ever has been. Um, you know, I'm 39. I started when I was like 18, 19. And, and back then, a, a career in the arts meant you're either going to go work for Creative New Zealand or, you know, that was or APRA. You know what I mean? And that was pretty much it. Where now, you know, you have plenty of musicians making, making money and making a life and supporting families off it. But I always say that, the chance, because people go, how hard is it to become a musician and and make a make a living, like a decent living, a living wage off it? And I say it's about the same odds as becoming an All Black, and it's probably about the same amount of work required, like you know the same amount of commitment 
um, the same amount of luck as we talked about, um, you know, but that's how hard you have to work to get it because the competition is so fierce. And, you know, being a musician um, and making money is like, it's a very thin triangle at the top of the pyramid of people who make money, but it can definitely be done and it's getting easier and easier every day and it's a lot easier now to, um, like record labels like the Wild West out there, you know, I remember downloading and everything, it's much easier to hold on to your rights and monetize what you're doing. Um, and, you know, th you have amazing organizations like the MMF and Music Commission that are training a new level, a new um, wave of kind of executives and stuff who are going to come through and, and help you with that journey. As a promoter, just start and run before you, I mean, walk before you can run. Like I've seen plenty of people go out and then go and just bet way too big. And you're just like, yeah, you just lost your house. Like I've seen that a few times. Like you lost 800 grand in one show. But weirdly, the biggest show before you did before this was a power station. What were you doing swinging for the fences on a 10,000 cap outdoor arena? I mean, outdoor festival play. It's like, it's insane. You know what I mean? Like you think of, you, you're going to have to make all those mistakes and it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to have to make them. So why not do that in a smaller environment like a tuning fork show where if it went completely haywire, you lost three grand, which is horrible, but not the end of the world, as opposed to trying to do one in the room next door at the arena, which again, I've seen people do. And you're just like, you thought you're going to sell 10,000 tickets, you sold 800 and you still put the show on and you put the full production and you lost a million dollars, you know, and you know, that's the way it goes. You know, like I consider myself at least a semi-experienced promoter. I know roughly what I'm doing and all the rest of it. And we still have some horrific nights in our years. You know, we have some glorious ones as well. But, um, you know, I just, it would be, to, the advice would be to slowly build into it. You know, there's no, don't be in such a rush to to rip the face off Live Nation. You know what I mean? There's plenty of people already trying to do that. You know, yeah. you don't need to get in the queue straight away, you know? Yeah. I, I love that idea about um, making a living in music being like being a professional athlete. Yeah. Like in the way that there's quite a few artists in New Zealand who, um, in the same way that All Blacks kind of get uh, put out to pasture in uh, France yeah, or Japan, totally. there's all of these really great New Zealand artists um I can think of a bunch of drum and bass acts, yeah, particularly, who, are, who make a living out of touring through kind of Eastern Europe yeah. once or twice a year. Yeah, uh, Fat Freddy's doing yeah. their tours through Europe. Yeah. And, and like that is just, a, a, yeah, it's an amazing way. But they put in the work. Yeah. They're, they're touring, they're yeah. working, just like high performance yeah. athletes. Well, my favorite, like, make now starting to do proper numbers and make money is that my black metal band Ulcerate, mm -hmm. who you, most people listening to this probably haven't heard of, but have just found a niche. And just filled it and now are playing to like reasonable numbers of sort of four, five, six, seven hundred people when they go through Europe and, and the States. And you can make money on that. And they are, they're building a career. They keep their touring lean. I think there's three in the band and they take two crew. And, you know, they're not like staying at a five star park high, but it's also not awful, you know. And they're just a smart bunch of guys who found a corner and have filled it, you know what I mean? And there's been some great and still are some electronic music examples of that or even classical or things like that you know what i mean so it's you know it's like i said it's more accessible now but the competition is still as fierce mm -hmm. you know yeah. and as a final thought like how do you define success like you know having had million dollar nights and probably um big nights that didn't go your way and uh and worked with some of these acts and and, and really um put on some of the biggest gigs people mm -hmm. might think it was very successful how do you define success um my definition of success has changed drastically not just change yeah, it's changed drastically over the last 10 15 years um when i was a younger younger man i was much more about like oh we made this or we did this and no 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 but you much more realize now that it's about it's one of the things i like about lan and laneways is about building something you know we have a considerable amount of staff here a big part of my life now is mentoring people and bringing them through and, and making sure um that they're getting the resources they need, but getting better at what they do. You know what I mean? I take a lot of satisfaction in training, say, like I said before, Sam and Georgia on how to program a festival and how to spot talent and how to bring them through or care on how to do marketing and, and, and bring stuff through and, and working as part of a group. I find that incredibly rewarding. Um, but also um, using the influence and the position we have to try and do things like making our shows safer and making laneway safer and and trying to take on things like you know sexual assault at shows and stuff like that and we we have a bit of a microphone and a bit of influence so trying to use that to to make things better and make them not as shit as they have been in the past you know what i mean my partner 
um, you know, has been the victim of, of, you know, of catcalling and groping and stuff at shows. Some of my staff have at our own shows, you know what I mean? Um, there was a prominent accusation against a media figure in the indie music community about, you know, it happened a couple of years ago for something that happened seven or eight years ago at a Seafarer show down on the waterfront. That was my, I was the promoter of that show. You know, I mean, it's incredibly jarring. So we've started putting in things like safe spaces for women and, and hotlines and, and, and trying to, but the, the, the grass level is trying to train staff and security and doormen and stuff and how to deal with people who have been assaulted or something like that. And like, there's some great initiatives out there, but the hardest thing is just trying to find um, people who can train those people in specific music ways because a lot of the training out there is for like office place and I'm like that's great but this you know it's there's you know a speed metal band is playing on stage a girl is crying at the barrier you know the HR classic technique of let's pull aside here and I'll bring in you know Judy and we'll talk about it it's like that doesn't apply here it's a very unique set of circumstances so we're actively trying to find more people who can help last year we brought some people in from Australia who trained all our laneway senior laneway staff on that and you know and we're trying to do more of that you know that to me is success is how do you make it a better industry for everyone who's working on it that and making millions of dollars yeah, <laughs> yeah. well that's awesome well uh yeah go well with uh the laneway event uh, thank you very much for having me thank you for joining us mark nevo oh, head of promotions at live nation and the co-promoter at laneway thanks thank you very much to tina tiller for producing and thank you for having us along in your ears You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. And brought to you by the spin off and Callahan Innovation. From the spin off podcast network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin Off Podcast Network.